initial management of trauma. Outline Overview Epidemiology Introduction Initial management Initial assessment Supportive treatment Overview Trauma is one of the leading causes of deaths worldwide and the WHO has estimated that in 2020 it will be the third most common cause of death in the world. Road traffic accidents are responsible for majority of trauma and most victims are in the productive age group of 15 to 50 years. Epidemiology of Burns In India, trauma accounts for about 90,000 deaths each year, constituting 10% of all trauma deaths worldwide. For each death due to trauma, 13 persons are grievously injured. Introduction Though trauma is a potentially multi-system problem and major injuries are best managed in dedicated units, most trauma deaths may be prevented with simple measures that require minimal facilities. Effective management of trauma requires three components. 1. Rapid access to appropriate therapeutic modalities. 2. A protocol-directed approach. 3. Personnel trained or familiar with this protocol. Deaths arising from trauma have a trimodial pattern. Immediate. These deaths occur with seconds to minutes after injury. Intermediate. These deaths occur one to two hours after injury. Late. These are injuries that occur days or even weeks. Initial management. The patient management priorities are as follows. 1. Life-threatening conditions are assessed clinically and treated as they are diagnosed. 2. Potentially life-threatening conditions are usually picked up clinically or with bedside investigations and plain x-rays. 3. Limb-threatening conditions are then assessed and managed. 4. Finally, other injuries that do not fall into this category are managed. These are also important, both from a medico-legal aspect as well as a functional aspect. Initial Assessment Primary Survey Assess ABCDE Airway Maintenance with Cervical Spine Control Breathing Circulation with Hemorrhage Control Disability Exposure and Environment Control A. Airway Maintenance with Cervical Spine Control When a patient is unable to talk, do the airway assessment. Look for obvious distress such as use of accessory muscles of breathing and cyanosis. Listen for abnormal sounds such as grunting, gurgling or streeder. Feel for crepitus in the mandible indicating a fracture, the position of the trachea and laryngeal crepitus. Patients who have maxillofacial, neck injuries, foreign body, bleeding into the airway or evidence of burn injury on the face should have their airway cleared as and when an abnormality is recognized. B. Breathing After establishment of airway, Attention is paid to breathing. The assessment of breathing includes Rate and pattern of respiration Percussion Auscultation of the chest Confirmation of the position of the trachea C. Circulation with hemorrhage control Assessment of the circulatory system is primarily clinical. Pulse, capillary refill, blood pressure urine output, respiratory rate and mental status are the parameters used to assess the circulatory state. D. Disability In the primary survey, 
Disability includes assessment of the Glasgow Comma Scale score and the papillary reaction. E. Exposure and Environment Control This is the final part of the primary survey. The patient should be completely stripped to expose the whole body for the secondary survey. Once the patient is exposed, he or she should be covered appropriately to minimize hypothermia. Adjunct to the primary survey Real-time monitoring of the ECG, the SpO2 and invasive or non-invasive blood pressure. A complete blood count, electrolytes and urea. Chest and pelvic x-rays and other x-ray depending on injury. Nasogastric tube Orogastric tube in patients with skull base fractures. Urinary catheter. A central venous catheter. Secondary survey. The secondary survey is a head to toe examination of the patient for detecting all injuries. Priorities include identification of potentially life threatening injuries and limb threatening injuries. It also includes a reassessment a more detailed one of the primary survey at the end of the secondary survey further radiological studies and special procedures may be done if required region specific examination and management a head and face examine the scalp for evidence of lacerations contusions and fractures test the eye for visual equity pupillary size and reaction, hemorrhages in conjunctiva and fundi, penetrating injuries, optic nerve injury, entrapment of nerve, lens dislocation. Examine the maxillofacial area for bone fractures, mandibular injury. Consider a prophylactic definitive airway to prevent development of airway obstruction later. B. Neck and cervical spine. Inspection for bruising, hematomas, and evidence of penetrating injury, presence of an expanding hematoma, indicating major vessel injury. The neck palpation for presence of hematomas, crepitus, broken cartilage, cervical spine tenderness, or deformities. Carotid auscultation for the presence of broods indicating injury. C. Chest. Potentially life-threatening injuries such as a pneumothorax, hemothorax, flail chest, sternal fractures and myocardial injuries should be looked out for. The chest is inspected for the presence of bruising, lacerations or contusions. Look for paradoxical movement of the chest wall indicating a flail chest that may require positive pressure ventilation or oxygenation. The chest wall is palpated for tenderness or crepitus of the ribs, sternum and clavicle. Muffled heart sounds on auscultation may indicate a cardiac tamponade with associated distended neck veins and the presence of hypotension. The cardiac tamponade may require pericardiosynthesis or surgical intervention. D. Abdomen Look for tenderness, guarding and distension. Presence of ecchymosis in the flanks may indicate retroperitoneal bleeding. In patients with a suspected intra-abdominal injury, a CT scan and or surgical intervention to explore and control the bleeding should be done without delay. If a patient is unstable, the patient has to be taken up for exploratory laparotomy at the earliest without waiting to stabilize the patient for a CT scan. E. Perineum and urogenital system The perineum should be examined for any bruising, contusions or lacerations, discoloration, which may indicate a pelvic fracture. All patients should have a rectal examination for lacerations, bleeding or any other abnormal finding. A urinary catheter is inserted after excluding a urethral injury. F. Musculoskeletal system. Inspect the limbs for deformities, contusions or lacerations. 
All bones are palpated along their entire length looking for deformities and tenderness. All joints are then put through their entire range of motion again looking for limitations. Injury may be excluded in a conscious and alert patient who can perform the entire range of motions of a particular joint. The examination should also include palpation of all the peripheral pulses for indication of vascular injury. Vascular injuries are more common with penetrating injuries and in limb dislocations. In these cases, also examine peripheral nervous system for peripheral nerve injuries. G. Nervous system. The neurological assessment include three components. 1. Level of consciousness. The lowest possible GCS score is 3 and the maximum is 15. All patients with GCS greater than equal to 8 are in coma and need endotracheal intubation early in the course of management to protect the airway, ensure oxygenation and control CO2 26 to 30 mmHg PaCO2. A change in the GCS of two or more points means that the patient has deteriorated and a decrease of three or more implies a severe deterioration needing surgery if remediable. 2. Pupils The pupils should be evaluated for any difference in size and for its reaction to light. Local ocular injuries can also cause these changes. 3. Extremity weakness The presence of motor weakness and its location, lateralization is to be documented. Supportive treatment A. Nutrition Enteral feeds should be commenced at the earliest. If it is not possible, parenteral nutrition should be commenced. If the patient is not adequately resuscitated or on high-dose inotropes, enteral feeding should be delayed till stabilization is achieved. On an average, 25 to 30 kcal per kg per day should be delivered. B. Analgesia Provision of analgesia is important in patients involved in trauma. The choice of agent would depend case by case. In general, simple analgesics like paracetamol, parenteral form is available, should be tried first. The next step would be usage of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. If there is no contraindication, opiates like morphine or fentanyl as appropriate. Nerve blocks may be an alternative in limb fractures provided there is no risk of compartment syndrome. In case of thoracic trauma with multiple rib fractures, epidural analgesia has been shown to provide better analgesia and outcome. C. Stress Ulcer Prophylaxis The following group of patients need stress ulcer prophylaxis. A. Mechanically ventilated patients. B. Patients with coagulopathy. C. Head injury. D. Burns. D. Deep venous thrombosis prophylaxis. Patients with spine fractures and spinal cord injuries are at increased risk of deep venous thrombosis. Other factors like old age, high injury severity score, ISS, long bone fractures, pelvic fractures and head injury are other risk factors. Use of anticoagulants may be contraindicated in most patients involved in trauma. Mechanical devices like sequential compressive devices and stockings may be the only available option in this group of patients. This may also not be possible in patients with lower limb injuries, thus constraining the available options.